All right. Hello, everyone. I'm glad you took part of your Sunday afternoon on this memorial for St. Anthony of the Desert, Anthony of Papua, to uh, join us. Um, so I wanted to talk today. Um, this is a requested uh, program about uh, the, the flow of grace and some understanding of the structures or the schematic, if you will, a schematic view of how grace flows and, um, and some attributes or some characteristics of grace. But um, before we get too deep into that, I want to start with a prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of life, for deigning that we live in this time. We thank you for the opportunity to labor in your kingdom, to build up your church. Lord, we, we thank you for life itself. Blessed Mother, we ask for your prayers and your intercession today so that the words that we have are words of clarity, words of benefit, words that draw us ever closer to God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to, this is a ramble warning. I'm going to ramble for a few minutes. So I'm going to, and then when I get through rambling, hopefully we can connect some dots. So I'm sitting today in the office of the Boxar Ranch at an elevation of 7,500 feet in the Wind River Mountains, at the edge of the Bridger Teton Wilderness, in just outside of Coral, Wyoming. For those of you who are coming to this retreat or any of the other retreats we're doing, this is the location for those retreats. It's an amazing place. And so on my way in, you drive about eight miles off of the pavement. And I was in Lander this morning uh, receiving some sheep and went to mass, received the sheep, and then came over. And so a few things that, as I was thinking about the flow of grace and, and grace in general. One of the things that we lose sight of it are the agrarian rhythms, the natural rhythms. And so as I unloaded the ewes and lambs this morning, uh, there were 54 ewes and there were 106 lambs. So almost twins for everybody. There were just a couple that had singles. And so it was amazing um, out of all of that trailer, all of those ewes, all of those lambs were not together in transport. You separate the lambs so they don't get crushed. And then within five minutes of them all coming off the trailer, within five minutes, every lamb, every pair of lambs had found their mother. And their mothers had called to them and, and they had found each other after a, about a four hour separation. So that call that resonance, the sheep may sound the same to us, but they're very, very clear. They, they can't rely on smell. Uh, oftentimes, especially after transport in such close quarters, they're sharing smell. It is to know the call. It's to know the voice uh, of your mother, of your father. And then ultimately, this is the voice of God. And so that, remember, we we had a rambling warning. Grace that flows into and through the gravid woman or the pregnant woman is extremely important because through fetal imprinting, it sets up the person, the unborn person's response to God before they ever meet God, the, the response to their father. What is her response to the sound of the father of the child, the sound of his voice, the, the proximity. What is her reaction to the mass? Is she peaceful? Is she fretful? All of this will bear on the personality or disposition of the child. We say in the horse business, she carries him inside for 10 months and alongside for eight months. And so she's got more to do with how he reacts to the world than anything else. And so Motherhood, rightly ordered motherhood, is a, it, it is such a font and such a fountain and such a pathway of grace. 
And to see the Blessed Mother in this context, I think, is really, really important um, because she of all creatures, she the greatest of all creatures, is hailed with the following words from Gabriel. He says, hail, full of grace. One of the translations is, hail you through whom all grace shall flow. And we'll come back to that. Why is, does all grace flow through the Blessed Mother? Um, the patristics were very, the church fathers were very clear on this, that, that every bit of it flows through her, because every bit of grace flows through the sacrifice on Calvary. And to, to no degree was that sacrifice compromised either by the mother, the Blessed Mother, or the Father, God the Father. We're going to come back to that because the passion is so very, very key. So I'm just putting a bunch of things out there. Remember, you had the rambling morning. So as I'm driving in, you drive eight miles on a gravel road after you turn off the hardtop. So what's happening in western Wyoming right now is the antelopes started having babies last week. And so you saw one or two, and then I saw six this morning uh, or today on the way in. And so by the time you come to the retreat in two weeks, the range will be full of antelope babies. I went to the Extraordinary Form Mass this morning in Lander, Wyoming, at Our Lady of the Rosary. And for those of you who don't know where that's located, the church is, sits on a little hill over, and then looks into the Wind River Range. There's a hay meadow down below it and an irrigation ditch and some 30 steps over the irrigation ditch and then up to the steps of the church. There were two mule deer fawns, not more than four days old, walked up the steps and up to the flat part right in front of the church. What does this have to do with grace? Grace is not only the flow of grace, but the draw of grace. And we talk about push and draw when you're doing stockmanship. So the difference between dominion and domination Domination is always push. Dominion is always draw, drawing to. The ewes this morning did not run out and, and gather their uh, lambs in, in a rough way. They stood in one place and called to them and then allowed the lambs to come to them. And so push and draw, um, the, that disposition, uh, I think, is one that we need in, in this discussion of grace. Calves, I moved uh, yesterday, we moved a set of cows and calves. And so what I did was I simply rode out with a dog and rode around the cattle about three times. By the time I did that, all the calves had gotten up, their mothers started calling, and they found their mothers. I gave them a few minutes to nurse, and then we started moving. That way, no calf gets left behind. What I'm what I'm getting at is in the hustle and bustle of today's world, we are pushers. We are dominators. We, we lose that agrarian rhythm, that deeper rhythm of allowing souls to communicate one call, the other call back. We, we've lost that. Um, for those of you who uh, remember some of, uh, how I'll date myself, but there was a, uh, a singer named Nelson Eddy, and he had various other um, female singers, but all of his songs were, uh, he would call and they would answer back. He would call and they would answer back. This is straight out of Song of Songs. Song of Songs flows through that anticipatory union of a soul with Christ. The patristics interpret the, the church fathers, St. Thomas and others, always interpreted so, Song of Songs as one soul calling to another, and the physical description was simply a methodology by which we, we could talk about the yearning of one soul for another. Modernly, this has now been interpreted in the last 50 years by non-virginal laymen or worse Jesuits who have no clue about the depth and profundity of soul communication. So grace is the medium by which souls communicate, and it is the medium by which they communicate with God, and God communicates with them. So, into the rambling. Now that you have these images out there, into the rambling. So, let's talk about the schematic. 
for those of you who are engineers or plumbers or electricians, this methodology of examination is going to be very, very uh, familiar to you. And so it does work like circuitry. It works like electricity flowing or water flowing. There are certain properties to um, the element which flows. There are certain properties to grace. There are certain properties and attributes to the conduits that will conduct it, uh, either electricity or water or whatever the medium may be, whatever the element may be, then the conduit must conform to the element. The element will not conform to the conduit. In other words, things will either conduct electricity or they, or they will not. Things will either hold and convey water or they will not. And so our desire to receive grace is, is absolutely minimal in the, in the totality of our ability to receive it. The desire to receive grace, the desire for God, is what motivates us to conform our will to his will. And grace is conferred through the will. It is conferred through the construct of will. So let's look at the, this schema and let's look at, um, at first, as the Trinity, the Father, Potter, Filio, Son, Spiritu, Church. These are the three persons of the Holy Trinity. And so grace, the concept of grace, emanates from and is created by he who creates all things, and that is God the Father. It creates, he creates grace like he creates all things. He is the origin of grace, and then it flows through the filio, the Son. So let's hang there for a moment, and let's talk about what this is. So this grace that flows through the Son this is the grace of salvation. This is the grace of conversion. This is actual grace and sanctifying grace. So Catholic theology has always differentiated between actual grace, that grace with, uh, which allows us to act or to do a certain thing, and sanctifying grace, and that's the grace which makes, makes us pleasing uh, to the Holy Spirit, to, the, to God the Father in a tangible form, who then indwells in us, and the manifestation of that is true Christian charity, love of neighbor for love of God. And then we're back to God the Father, which initiates an even greater flow of grace when we approach him uh, in this disposition of charity. So let's go back and, and parse this out a little bit more. What this comes from, what this chart comes from, is the understanding and, and the premise that the diabolical seeks to impede or to occlude grace. It seeks to stop the flow of grace because it is grace which gives us the ability to act, move toward God, and sanctifies us, makes us pleasing to God. So the other, it's, it's important to understand that the diabolical is doing something you're not doing. The diabolical is constantly thinking about salvation in the negative sense. We're not always thinking about salvation. So your enemy, and if you were at the extraordinary form this morning, St. Peter admonishes again, beware, be sober, be alert. Not just in the fifth chapter when he describes him as a roaring lion, but he uses the word sobriety four times in very close succession, which is to be aware. We're not always aware. We, we spend a lot of the time spiritually clueless. And then we come in contact with something um, that snaps us back to reality. So God the Father creates grace, and then every drop of grace flows through Christ. Now, listen to the prologue to John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and nothing that came to be came to be without Him. Grace is this medium by which the unseen God becomes manifest in the Word, becomes tangible. 
And then in this tangibility, now we have something that can be multiplied, it can be spread, and can be physically encountered. And so if you see on your diagram, Filio Son, and then under that is Church and Blessed, Blessed Virgin Mary. What I'm about to say has been Catholic teaching for 19 centuries. It's only in the last 50 to 60 years that we've seen and heard anything different. But it's very, very simple, and it's based upon this premise that Christ institutes the sacraments, and when he ascends, the sacraments reside in his bride, the church. And the, do the dogma that goes with that, the dogmatic statement is, there is no salvation outside the church. That's still on the books. It's still a dogmatic statement. It is still valid, regardless of what we would like to think. There is no salvation outside the church, meaning there's no salvation outside the sacraments. The sacraments and sacramental theology are absolutely necessary for the understanding of the not only the disposition, but the transmittal of grace, because it is through those sacraments. They, were, they, they repose, they are kept in the church. The Blessed Virgin Mary is the epitome of the sacraments and of the sacramental configuration to, to God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit as spouse. So let's look at her roles. She is the favored daughter. She is the spouse. She is the mother. So if you're working backwards in the diagram, she is the favored daughter of the potter, of the father, of the creator. And he elevates her through her docility, through her humility, through her willingness to be this unreserved instrument. And then she becomes the spouse of the Holy Spirit. This manifests in the physicality that is Christ the Son. Sacraments are, the, are physical. They're not, there's a very tangible thing to the sacraments. And so now let's look at the sacraments. Let's focus on filio church, uh, the church, the son, the church, and the blessed mother. First of all, in this sub-trinity of the trinity, it's a sub-trinitarian relationship. I'm not elevating the church. and I'm not elevating the blessed mother. So please don't misunderstand. But we are trinitarian in our own nature. Uh, meaning three parts. And so this, this particular part of the, of the Holy Trinity, the Son, is ever present to and ever present with the church and the Blessed Virgin Mary. So you cannot separate them. You cannot logically or functionally say, um, yeah, Jesus is my homeboy. I'm good with Jesus. I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. I, uh, I worship in the mountains. I don't need the church. Or even the, the fallacy that the people are the church. Mm, people are part of the church. People are not the church. This, this is new age stuff. The church is the church, and she exists because Christ instituted her. And she exists whether there's one, none, or a million. She exists because he instituted the church. And so that's something that's beyond us. And the church is not what we make it. It's not what this Holy Father or that Holy Father says. It's not what this prelate says or that prelate says. It is what Christ said. It is, it is the place which one receives the sacraments through which one is conformed in their will to God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Nor can you separate the Son and the Church from the Blessed Virgin Mary. You simply cannot do it any more than you could separate a man from his family or his mother. He, he may estrange himself, they may estrange themselves from him. The church at times has tried to estrange itself from both the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Christ the Son in his real presence, and it will do so again. That doesn't change what, I, what 
we know to be true, and it's not true because I'm saying it. The early church fathers said it. We see it functionally because what happens is the diabolical wants to fracture this unity of son, church, blessed mother, blessed mother, son, church, church, blessed mother, this, this relationship. And so this is what is Diablo. This is what is divided. This is what the, the adversary seeks to divide. And so there needs to, just as there has to, needs to be a balance in our devotion to God, the Father, Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in order to be a conduit of grace, there must be a, um, a disposition that recognizes church and Blessed Virgin Mary as a prudent to the Son. You, you can't separate. Them. So now let's go into the sacramental formula. And the sacramental formula is the sacrificial formula. And so when you start to look at the sacraments and, and sacramental theology and sacrificial theology, we need to be drawing some parallels. So first and foremost, and this is something, again, that has been uh, changed in the last uh, generation, and that is the understanding of the necessity for sacrifice and for sacrament. And the necessity is sin. Sin is the font from which all our problems flow. Every single problem, every single issue, every single bump in the road, hiccup, whatever you want to call it, flows from sin. When is the last time we heard a homily about sin? In fact, there is a concerted effort, especially in the, uh, the new mass, but especially with penitential choices, there is a movement, a concerted movement away from the confidio. This idea that it's this, that the confession and acknowledgement of sin is central. So the preeminent sacrament that disposes one to grace is the sacrament of penance, the sacrament of confession. And it must precede all other sacraments. Wait a minute. Those of you who are saying baptism, hang on. Modernly, that's what is taught, is that baptism is the preeminent or primary sacrament, and everything flows from that. It's not so. And the reason that that's not so is that in sin, the focus is not on us. The focus is on God. When we acknowledge that we've done something which offends God, we're even taught modernly that shame is a, is a vice. Shame is actually a virtue, according to St. Thomas, rightly ordered. And he defines it as the distress caused by the knowing of wrongdoing. Very succinct definition. So that that, that uh, physical reaction to doing wrong, that's shame. And it should drive you to the confessional. It is in the confessional that we, we come before God, we, we intone the Psalm 130, out of the depths I cried to you, O Lord. Psalm 51, the Friday Psalm, have mercy on me, O Lord, a sinner. This is absolutely necessary. This is the switch. This is the, the irrigation gate. This is the valve. This is what opens the conduit to the flow of grace. And so there has to be this mechanism by which grace flows into the system. And that methodology, that valve, that gate, that switch is confession. Even in baptism, the parents and godparents are to come to the, the, the sacrament, the proximity of the sacrament, the proximity of grace. They're to come to that in a reconciled state, a state of grace, to be reconciled with God. And that's done through the sacrament of penance. Every other sacrament has as its prerequisite penance. So when you see it this way, and it's, it's, a, it's a modern relativist shift that says baptism is the first one. Penance, the recognition that there is a need for the sacraments. There is a need for the sacrifice. 
there is a need, there is a just claim on humanity. In God's justice, there must be a sacrament. There must be a sacrifice. There must be this desire to be reconciled to God. And so when you hear someone say, give me my sacraments, oh my goodness gracious. So you've got, a, you've got someone who's throwing the switch and there's no wiring behind it, or they're opening the valve and there's no pipe on the other side. There's no way to, to contain it, to transmit it. There's no way to, um, to continue the flow of grace. So in the schematic of grace, we have to understand that we have to, number one, be in a position to receive it. Number two, be able to then carry it and convey it. This necessity, there are those in this audience I know who will remember this. Your Eucharistic ministers. Years ago when this uh, aberration started or this phenomenon or whatever you want to call it, but years ago, when the whole idea of being a Eucharistic minister started, do you remember in your training, you were told, be sure and go to confession the day before? Do you remember that? When's the last time you heard that? Again, it's falling away. The whole confidior, the understanding that we're sinners, the understanding that all, is, all of this is gift and it necessitates the sacrifice on Calvary. It necessitates the mass. The mass becomes performance art. It becomes theater. It becomes something that we're entitled to. Look at the latest COVID shutdown. We were entitled to the mass. Excuse me? We're entitled to nothing. This is all gift. And so we're entitled to the sacraments. We are not entitled to the sacraments. We must avail ourselves of the grace that is available. That sounds circular. But... The idea that we are owed grace, that shuts you off immediately. It redirects. It's a switch that doesn't work. It's a valve that opens to nowhere. Because it's the understanding that we, the Psalm 51, have mercy on me, O Lord, a sinner. So the absence of the sacraments, I can remember Father Ripper, I overheard him in a conversation. The woman was beside herself. She says, we have no access to confession. He, his response was so simple. It was, don't sin. Who ever thought of that? You know, everyone talks about um, unplanned childhood, uh, un unplanned pregnancy. Stop the sex. Stop doing what causes it. But we are not willing to step up and look at the will issue, the weakness of the human will. In the Depression and at the 30s was when Abortion was first openly talked about, and it was a very false sympathy, especially from the Margaret Sangers of the world who said, don't bring a child into poverty. The world is a dark and, and horrible place. Well, if it's that dark and horrible, then why are you having sex? Stop what causes. And so this understanding of the impediment of grace is when we step outside the flow of grace and ask God to come to us, that's not going to happen. The river doesn't change course. You must go to the river, this flow of grace. And so now let's go down into our chart, and we see, let's go down this um, to the left. Let me, uh, I'm going to take a break at, um, oh my goodness. I'm going to take a break at uh, 15 after the hour, and then we'll have some, some questions on what I've covered till there. But I want to go through this first leg, um, and then we're going to go back up and pick up the, uh, the angels. So I'm going, to, I'm going to go about 10 more minutes down this first leg. So grace flows through the sacraments. If grace flows through the sacraments, then it must be facilitated by vocation. In other words, there must be a vocation through which the grace will flow. The individual, the individual must be disposed to grace, and then the vocation must be disposed to grace. There are only two vocations. 
vocation is sacrifice. It means that I choose this method by which I will give my life back to God. Traditionally, anciently, St. Alphonsus Liguori wrote about it more, more prolifically than anyone else. He wrote a short tract called The State of the Religious Life, but he was very clear, as were other church fathers and doctors of the church, who recognized only two vocations. And those two vocations are marriage or the religious life. Priesthood being a part of religious life because one must first give himself to God in religious life. This is another thing that we did not hear until the last 60 years, and that was a young man say, I'm called to be a priest, or I've discerned the priesthood. Wow. This is like a young man saying, I'm going to be married because I want to be a father. All of us can recognize the disorder in that. Or the woman saying, I want to be married so that I can be a mother. Those are disordered focal points. While a man may be in his, he may think he's being called to be a priest, he must first be called to give himself to God and then let the superior determine whether or not he's going to be a father, a priest in the same way that God determines whether or not we're going to be fathers and mothers in marriage. This is what I'm saying is highly controversial. It really chafes on the modern ear, and the adversary is all over it. Because if the adversary can get couples to marry because they want to have children, then he's already put a condition on the spousal sacrifice. He's already got them to put a condition on the vocation itself. And so it's not a free gift. It's not an unrestricted gift. It's not an unreserved gift. When the man says to, um, and, and one of the real problems with this in, the, in priesthood and religious life is the secular or diocesan priesthood, which treats it as a, as a job track, a career path. It says, from the time you tell the bishop you want to be a priest, until you're a priest is four to six years. We're going to fast track you through this. When the orders were forming priests, it was up to the superior to determine when the man took his final, his minor orders, when he was elevated to transitional diaconate. And he might linger there for years in that formation until when he was ordained a priest, he was a priest. He was fully formed. And to make my point, you never heard very, very, very rarely did you ever hear of a priest being laicized or leaving his vocation, divorcing the church, essentially. You never heard of that a generation ago. You certainly never heard of it a hundred years ago. The idea that someone can stop being a priest, doesn't. it simply doesn't work that way because he's ontologically configured to God in a different way through all that formation. Why am I saying this? Because priests get possessed too. Monks, brothers, religious, sisters, they get possessed too. And the possession is always going to be dependent upon a psychological compatibility with the diabolical. More often than not, that psychological compatibility with the diabolical is a reservation made on the part of the person, a reservation or a condition. I will be married as long as I can have children. And then if I can have children, now we might be doing some kind of artificial thing. We might be doing something else. We might be doing this, or I might leave my wife, or I might leave my husband because we can't, he or she can't give me children. Listen to the language. This is the, our case docket is rife with these cases. This is why I'm really, really hammering on this is because this is one of the first inroads into the destruction of vocation is that it comes in with uh, a condition or a reservation. I'll, I'll get married as long as, and, or I'll, I'll uh, enter the seminary as long as, I'll enter the priesthood as long as. This is, this is destined 
for failure from the start. Whether it's physical fatherhood or spiritual fatherhood, that's determined by God the Father through a superior or by him directly in the case of marriage, the vocation of marriage. St. Alphonsus is very clear. What he says is two things. One is that a vocation delayed is a vocation denied. The millennials have elevated to an art form discernment. What does this look like? It looks like your 35-year-old son sleeping on your couch, eating your groceries, still trying to figure out who he is or what he's going to do. So that's what it looks like in real terms. A vocation delayed is a vocation denied. So the adversary is really subtle in trying to convince us that we are only blessed by making the right choice. God does not bless the choice. God blesses the commitment. St. Alphonsus, God blesses not the choice, the commitment. Take your hand from the plow. Don't look back. If you choose married, marriage, be married to this person. Don't look back. Don't think of others. Don't think, be in this one. Then what happens is in the priesthood, it becomes, if there's one condition, then there becomes more conditions. And it all militates against the authority of God the Father made manifest in the bishop. And so obedience is where it all starts to break down. If there's a reservation, then it's obedience if I free. And then the demon is in that vocation. He's in it in a very, very way. He's in it in a tangible way. So the grace flow chart came out of us identifying impediments to grace and then saying, all right, where is the root of these, of these impediments? Because all grace is created by God the Father and flows through Christ the Son and is manifest in charity, then you're going to see this. Here are your three indicators. A low-level anger or even a high-level rage at God the Father is going to close you off to grace. An unwillingness to suffer, as did Christ the Son. The unwillingness to sacrifice. The unwillingness to join your life to the Christ is going to close you off to grace. The unwillingness to engage in love of God for love of neighbor, love of neighbor for love of God, including the forgiveness of any and everyone, even those with a just claim, is going to close you off to grace. So now you see the sins against the impediments that are surrounding God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To deny charity or to quantify charity, to love one person more than another, to be un inordinately attached. All of these things work as impediments to grace. And so, Liber Christo, we developed the uh, FTC manual, for those of you who know what I'm talking about. This was a very methodical way to go through it. Incidentally, that's being rewritten in a, in a much more traditional and orthodox methodology. But it's still, that's the thinking behind it, is to work through those impediments to grace. So I'm going to entertain questions now and see uh, if we've got clarity so far. So take me to task. Let's really be sure we understand this before we go further down into the schema. All right, first question. Uh, if, I mean, does this mean that a person who remains single without becoming religious has not answered their vocational call? That is precisely what that means. Who is your authority? Is the, is the authority a spouse? Is the authority um, a bishop? Is the authority a superior? Under whose authority are you? And so this idea that we can become, that someone can become um, a consecrated virgin, either male or female, without being directly under a bishop or directly under a religious order. Uh, this is trying to have your cake and eat it too. And this was never, this has never been a recognized uh, vocation. Uh, just simply never has. Modernly, even if some bishops are promoting it, but it's never been a recognized vocation. So you need to be attached to an order either as a secondi, uh, secondary or a tertiary, but under the, um, under the authority uh, of an order, under the direct authority, this idea that I can be a free agent, um, then there's no vocation through which grace flows. Also, 
if you're not living in community and you're not responsible for souls through a domestic church and you're not res- you're not interacting in daily prayer, you're not in communal prayer. Um, according to, to tradition, there's really no structure for grace to flow. Uh, you can be a really really nice person. You can be a you can almost be a holy person. But the, the charity is lacking uh, a methodology through which it may be facilitated. And so to put yourself under the authority and to live a religious life under direction, you can't pick your own prayers or the hours you want to pray them. This is part of that being uh, under the authority. Now, many people uh, are third order Carmelites or third order Franciscans, but they're doing it on their own time. And oftentimes this ends up being problematic. We've had several cases where this was not the primary factor, but was a contributing factor to obsession, diabolical obsession. Okay. How does profanity and or detraction impede the flow of grace? Does the flow of grace resume if we make an act of contrition when we commit menial sin or only once we have been to the confessional? Okay, so this is going to be a multiple part, but it's a great question, so I'm going to stick with it. How does profanity and our detraction impede the flow of grace? So when you curse, the demon is looking for the mouth that curses and blesses, because in that conflict, he sees on your forehead the indelible mark of Christ, and then he sees in the rest of your body sinful behavior. That's the conflict that he can drive. And so he's looking, are we who we say we are? St. Paul, let your yes mean yes, your no mean no. And so our actions and our words have to to conform to our desire to be reconciled with God. Because in the moment that we curse, in the moment that we detract, especially because this is now both of these are these are two different sins. And so let's talk about them because we don't we don't really understand modernly that these are two different sins. So the cursing is a sin against God because it, it offends his justice. The detraction is a, is a sin against the Holy Ghost because it is a sin against charity. And so we've got a sin against purity, against God the Father, in profanity, for the sake of profanity. And it is the, both of these are the near occasion for the sin of another. This is what we lose. We do not have compunction. Every once in a while we'll get contrition, but we don't have compunction, which is the realization of my, the damage my actions have on another, another soul. So the next part, does the flow of grace resume if we make an act of contrition when we commit menial sin or only once when we have been to the confessional? So I'm assuming autocorrect corrected venial to menial, venial sin. So the concept of venial sin and this idea that they've kind of floated a perfect contrition replacing confession, <laughs> perfect contrition is kind of like being proud of your humility. You, you just, you, you don't get there. You just simply don't get there. It's not a workaround uh, as it was being touted that you don't need to go to confession because you can have perfect contrition. This, this flies in the face of, of tradition and, and true Catholic teaching. So if it is a venial sin, it should be, addre- it would be addressed in the confidior prior to mass because the confidior is designed to address the sins of thought, word, and deed that don't rise to the level of mortality, being a mortal or a killing sin. But at the same time, it makes us pure, recognizes our sin, purifies us for the, the coming Eucharist. And I think this is something that is very, very important, is that we lose sight of who we are trying to be reconciled to. Modernly, we're going to confession, so we're eligible for the Eucharist, not to be reconciled with God the Father. The purpose of confession and of the confidior is to be reconciled to God the Father. May God Almighty absolve you. You go to confession to be reconciled to God the Father of all mercies, not to be eligible for the Eucharist. 
we're eligible for the Eucharist because we're reconciled with God the Father. We lose this understanding of, of the, the Holy Trinity has a hierarchy. Christ himself speaks on multiple times. I came to do my Father's will. He, he doesn't say, I came to do what I want. He says, I come to do my Father's will. And this, the whole agony in the garden is the conformity of his will to God the Father. And up into including death, that, that sacrifice of the corpus. And so we're back to the will. So does the flow of grace resume? Uh, yes, if we make an act of contrition, if it's a venial sin, that's correct. That's, that is the theology and that's the way it works. Does this mean that a person who remains single without becoming a religious has not answered their vocational call? All of us are called to give our life to God. The church says there are two ways to do that. So now we're back to now we're back to what is the acceptable methodology, sacri sacrificial theology, what is acceptable that the church says and has always said. Okay. Do the FTC manuals still hold good in what they teach? The materials are no longer available. Available. The website seems down. The website is down. The materials are no longer available. So um, there is, uh, it's being rewritten. There's no heresy in the original F FTC. There is no heretical statements. However, there is a lack of, uh, because it was done by a committee, because it was done by many um, modernist, relativist, politically correct individuals who edited and contributed to it. Um, and I'm not saying that in an uncharitable way. It is simply the way it is. Um, then it became somewhat watered down and ineffective. And so it's like uh, we, we developed a, a 45 caliber pistol and that was highly accurate. And then we chose to shoot rubber bullets through it. So we're going to get some, some jacketed ammunition back in this pistol with the new rewrite. So there you go. That's a, probably an in, politically incorrect analogy. What about the flow of grace to widows and widowers? The flow of grace still flows through vocation, the vocation of marriage. Are we not still praying for um, deceased husbands and wives? Are we not still aware of the constructs of family and the souls that we're responsible to? And so I think it's a great question, but there's a subtlety. There's a real subtlety. Historically, what would happen is when someone was widowed, they remained widowed. They understood that they were part of a, a domestic church and souls were responsible for their purity, their piety, their remaining chaste. And so the idea of remarrying is the focus is on the individual, not on the, the larger family construct. This is hard to hear, but the diabolical see this. And when they say um, you're lonely or you need someone or you need to be with someone, you need to be with God. And so this, this loneliness um, should be an interior movement uh, to deeper prayer, deeper sacrifice. And so historically, the widows would go to the convent or would live in close proximity to the convent where they could engage in the daily prayer. They could engage in the pious practices um, while at the same time being spiritually responsible for their children and their grandchildren. So I mean, I'm just telling you how it used to work, and it was pretty effective. May you talk about blessing and how they convey grace. Thank you. Okay, so blessings. A curse is the opposite of a blessing. A blessing is the true medium by which we hope to uh, be a conduit of grace to, to others. And so... Um, and it's not a command. It's, it's not a ours to command. We are much more a conduit of grace and of blessing by living a righteous and just life, by being a living example. And so um, the desire to bless, uh, it has to be the desire for this soul to be in union with God for their own sake. We get hung up on trying to affect behavior, not conversion. Understand that more often than not, the prodigal experience is necessary. And if we focus on conversion and understanding that God has a relationship with this soul that is well beyond anything we may see or know, 
Um, and so don't get caught up in the particulars. And so the blessing, um, blessing, if you look at it more as an obligation, especially fathers, here at Box R, there is an obligation for uh, the patriarchal figures here to bless the premises, to pray on the premises, to ask God's blessing and to pray for each person here individually. So within the domestic church, uh, blessing is an obligation. Within the, the larger church, blessing is an obligation. So when the bishop goes through physically and makes this sign, it has a spiritual uh, effect, a very real spiritual effect. So if he's not home, how does he do that? He doesn't do that. Stay home. Stop being politicians. Stay in your diocese. Visit your diocese, especially the poor and the downtrodden. Go to the churches that are not giving. Don't go to the only the benefactor churches. Go to the beneficiary churches. Go to the places, the dark places in your diocese and extend your hand. It's the same for you fathers. Go into that teenage daughter's room. You know, the one who's wearing clothes she shouldn't be wearing, doing things she shouldn't do, texting and talking. Go that place. Be politically incorrect. The idea, oh, I don't want to offend her, drive her away. Go. That is your obligation. So that blessing, and you better be pure. You better have, you better be the just man if you're going to be that conduit of grace. We as men have obligations to dispense the blessing. Women, you're not off the hook. You have the obligation to dispose the soul to receive the blessing. You have the obligation to go into that daughter's room and say, your father loves you. Your father held you when you were baptized. Your father did this and this and this. Your grandfather did this and this and this, because ultimately God did this. Christ did this. You can't close yourself off to the graces that flow through uh, the patriarch in that family. And you can see the havoc that has been um, wrought by divorce, by separation, by all of these things, because quite frankly, women, if you convey a blessing, it better be by the authority and permission of your husband, because that's not yours to usurp. The spiritual authority in a family is not yours to usurp, and you, in fact, actually squeeze a large conduit of grace down into a, to a trickle. I deal with multiple cases every week, teleconferences with priests, husbands, and wives where the wife is the driver, and she has to take the back seat and let the husband drive if the diabolical is going to be cleared out. It is that simple. Um, so there was a politically incorrect rant. Are the auxiliaries of the society the most sorrowful mother a third order? They are. Are consecrated widows a traditional practice of the church? They are, provided they are attached to an order. Many of my aunts and uncles have left Holy Mother Church and are on fire for the Lord as Protestants. Now they're on fire for themselves and they're on an emotional roller coaster. Just sit still. It's like a merry-go-round. They'll come back by. They claim they read the Bible only, and as a result, God speaks to them. That's not God speaking. How does grace flow if a Protestant does not honor our blessed mother? It's not. It's a counterfeit of grace. Thank you for that opportunity. The task of disposing the children to grace also requires the same disposition of the wife. Wow. That is a million-dollar statement, and you are precisely right. The task of disposing the children to grace also requires the same disposition of the wife. What does that look like? Docility and obedience. You want rebellious children? Be rebellious. You want children that don't do what you say and that scheme? Scheme against your husband. Tell your, your children that your husband doesn't really understand because what you're doing is building in them a psychological mechanism by which they will rebel against you and they will find a way to go around what you say. So you want rebellious children, be rebellious. You want docile children, you want obedient children, then be docile and be obedient. There's the short course in disposition to grace. All right, so I'm going to take a 13-minute break and come back at a quarter till now that everybody is uh, riled up. So, all right. Nancy, if you could put that, there we go. There we go. So let's go one. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. 
So as we're looking at this, we talked about the flow of grace, that grace is created by he who creates everything, which is God the Father. And then it flows through the Son, the Word made flesh. And so Christ is the not only the epitome, the archetype, but he is the, the physical presence of God the Father. And so just keep going back to the prologue to John's gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, was with God, and the Word was God, and nothing that came to be came to be without him. What does this mean? It means that the unseen God, the God of thought, speaks. And so when we confess sins of thought, word, and deed, we're talking about the mechanism of the flow of grace impeded by sin. Sin impedes the flow of grace. And so if you are pure of thought, pure of word, pure of deed, then grace flows through that Trinitarian construct, thought, word, and deed. We think pure thoughts, we speak pure words, and we do pure things. In this way, we are an unimpeded conduit for grace that is created by God the Father, is manifest in Christ the Son, and then is perpetuated through the charity of the Holy Spirit. And so it flows through, all grace flows through the Blessed Mother. And so this understanding, this modern militation against her role as co-redemptrix and mediatrix of all graces is militating against 19 centuries of tradition, because very functionally, all grace flows through she, the gate of heaven. Gabriel, in fact, his salutation, hail, full of grace, or one translation, hail you through whom all grace will flow. Why is, is she this focal point? And let's look up to the left there at Lucifer. Lucifer is the focal point for the fall because this is the first creature whose will is not conformed to the holy will of God. God's will always and everywhere is union, modernly after the fall, translated salvation. So his will is that creature and creator be unified, be one. And the medium for that unity is grace. And so this is why the adversary militates against the medium of grace. And so Lucifer and his departure of will, and so he, he removes his will from God's, the conformity to God's will. This is creature now acting in a way and in a, a function that he was not created for. Modernly, this is called an off-label use. <laughs> what is our label? We are created in the image and likeness of God. And so if we act outside that image and likeness, then technically we're engaging in an off-label use, just like Lucifer did. When he says, I will not serve, he was created to serve. He was created to um, extend God's illumination, God's manifest presence into the cosmos to reflect the beauty of God. So Lucifer, the light bearer, who would be this conveyance of grace, this medium by which all creation is illuminated and unified, now becomes the prince of darkness. He becomes the antithesis. We do the same. So when we depart vocation, we actually, in our departure, now are militating against vocation. We're militating against the integrity of vocation. We're militating against the integrity of grace. So it's not that a priest can take a day off, because in that moment, if I, as a married man, as a husband, as a grandfather, if I say, I'm going to take a me day, in that moment, that's a Luciferian escape. It's a Luciferian uh, statement. I will not serve, because I'm configured to God the Father through my sacrifice, sacrificial and sacramental sacrifice of marriage. And then God has so deigned that I am a father and a grandfather. So when you enter that patriarchal, matriarchal role, even more um, imperative that you remain pure and just, and the merit of your prayer is ensured so that grace may flow through your office. It doesn't throw, flow through you individually. 
it flows through the office that you occupy. And so Lucifer is a creature who says, I will not serve. And then Satan is not an individual. Many different activities and individuals are satanic. Why do I say that? Let's look at how our Lord uses a particular word. And I think that that's going to be our working definition. If, if Christ uses the word. Where does he use this word? He uses it twice. He says, I saw Satan falling from the sky like light. He's describing the fall of Lucifer and a third of the heavenly hosts that were cast by their division of will. When they divide their will from God's will, they can't be in his proximity. And Satan is cast from the sky. So it's anything that's against God's will is by de definition satanic. We're going to hear it again. The scene is Caesarea Philippi. Christ and the apostles are there. And they're overlooking in the Eastern tradition. It's really interesting. They say that that rock at Caesarea Philippi was the height at which Satan or Lucifer took Christ and said, I'll give you all of this. It wasn't his to give. And so this questioning of Peter and the apostles has uh, a double and even a triple meaning. But Christ says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, right at this point, Simon says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you are right. This has been revealed to you from above. And I must go, very next statement, Jesus speaking, and I must go to Jerusalem to suffer and die. So he's been identified as God. And now he's saying, and I must go make sacrifice of myself. So he has just stated his holy will. What is the first pontifical statement? He's just been made pope, but I'll build my church on this rock, this statement. You're the, he's just been made Pope. What's the first pontifical statement? Oh, no, not you, Lord. And our Lord's response, get behind me, Satan. So what is the Satan is not Peter the man. It is the statement. It is against God's will. So we have the will of God being stated, and then immediately the man who makes the one statement makes the other statement. So we see that in our fallen nature, there is, though we recognize God, we recognize God's will, there is this adversity to it. And in that adversity to that will, that stiff neck, that unwillingness to be docile and obedient, in that moment, we're open to the adversary. This is a psychological compatibility that opens us to the whispering voice that says, don't die for these people. Don't sacrifice for this woman. No, don't sacrifice for this man. They're not worth it. They don't understand you. And then the seductive language starts. So devil is anything that divides. Diablo, the division. And so you're looking at an unholy trinity. The unholy trinity is Lucifer, Beelzebub, which is the spirit of corruption, versus the spirit of vivification and, and uh and, in, and integrity of life, and then either Satan and or the devil. So this is the unholy trinity that militates directly against and masquerades as the trinity. Lucifer would set himself up opposite to Christ, but he's creature, he's not creator. And so the antithesis to Lucifer is the blessed mother, because by her act of docility and humility and acceptance of who she is and what she is in the cosmos, she is elevated to the heights. And so she becomes the greatest creature, not by her nature, but by her caveat, by her fiat, by her total acceptance of God's will and her everlasting role in the unification of creation and creator. And so this is why everything flows through the sacraments sacramental theology and sacrificial theology because it's the giving back to God without reservation. So grace flows through the office of father and mother. One of the first lies that the adversary tells a soul 
is you were born to the wrong family. You were born to the wrong gender, the wrong ethnicity. You were born, these people don't understand you. And so in that subtlety, he's militating directly against God's will because God chose, God chose directly the conception to send your soul. How does he choose it? He chooses it the same way that he chose to send his son in the fullness of time, born of a woman for the salvation of men. Each of us are an agent of unification. Each of, each of us is an agent for salvation. And we are dropped into a spiritual battle, a hot zone. We paratroop our souls into the battle. He chose your father and your mother. He chose them. In this understanding, opens us to grace flowing through piety, which is love of God the Father for all he does, regardless of how he does it. And so some of us got the father and mother that exemplified righteousness and right father and right mother. Others of us got the father and mother that exemplified it by the absence. How often do we see a young man who is an exemplary father who had either no father or an abusive so where does that come from? Modern psycho psychology says that we can't give what we don't have. That's simply a false statement. How can I make that with such surety? The idea that we can't give what we don't have is false because the law of diminishing return says that if that were true, there would be no love left. If we can't give what we don't have, then how is there any love? How is there any charity? would have all been gone long ago. So the absence or even abuse often exemplifies the need and value of rightly ordered fatherhood, rightly ordered motherhood, and preceding that, right ordered spousal sacrifice, which is the gift of self without reservation. So the son or daughter's first spiritual obligation, first duty, is to receive love unconditionally. Now, the modern psychologists have a, an interesting little spin here. It's Luciferian because it says we are supposed to receive unconditional love. Listen to the difference. Humans are incapable of giving love unconditionally because of our fallen nature. So if we're not receiving love, according to modern psychology, if we're not receiving unconditional love, then who's to blame? Run right back up the chart and you'll be blaming God. You'll be blaming God and accusing him, along with the adversary, of wrong gender, wrong time, wrong ethnicity, wrong family. This is how subtle and the adversary starts to separate, starts to divide. To receive love unconditionally says that whatever love I received, whatever father I received, whatever mother I received, whatever childhood experience that was beyond my control, whatever I received was God, it was gift, because life itself is gift. And so this opens us to the disposition of grace. If we put any conditions, if we have any grudges, if we have any anger or resentment, then each of those works like a mineral deposit in a city water line all through the South, there are, in on town squares, there are big, huge water pipes that are choked down to this little bitty conduit through mineral deposits. The mineral deposits of sin, the mineral deposits of our life of unforgiveness choke our vocation, choke us down to where there is little, a little trickle. If you're going to restore that fountain of grace, that font of grace that flows through our offices, husband, wife, father, mother, then we have to be absolutely without impediment, without anything blocking that flow of grace. So the son is to receive love unconditionally, whatever it is. The mother in the blue, she's shaping the father as a construct in the heart of the son. Women, when you talk about your husband as being not understanding or not being the spiritual leader or somehow lacking, 
this has a very damaging psychological effect and starts to occlude grace flowing through his office if you're finding fault with him. It doesn't matter if he has the faults or not. They are not yours to share with the children, nor are the faults of the mother, the fathers to share with the children. These are impediments to grace. These are absolute impediments to grace. So if you're going to question each other's behavior with regard, especially the children, do that alone. Do it kneeling at the altar of your marriage. Do it kneeling at the bed. Say a rosary together, then criticize. It's really hard to do. Go back and, and repeat your marriage vows. Bless each other. Look into each other's eyes and remember that the grace that flows to these children is, is directly related to your purity and your integrity in the vocation. This is sacrificial theology. This is saying, I'm going to do this whether I feel like it or not. The next step is the brother. What is brother? Brother is the office or understanding of unconditionally sharing love. Sibling rivalry militates directly against this concept because it is the idea that love is somehow quantified. God's love is unquantified. Humans' love for their children is unquantified. How many of you had one child and you loved them with all your love and then you had the second child? So where did that love come from? God increases our capacity for love through the sharing of it. He increases our capacity for grace through the sharing of it. He increases our soul's capacity for him through this very office. And so, again, the exemplar, the wife is the exemplar here. The woman is the exemplar. This attribute refines the father in the heart of the son. It's the constant giving thanks. Because no matter what father you have, no matter what mother you have, there is something to be learned which has salvific value, either in the absence or in the proper execution of it. And this is what disposes the heart to grace. This is what disposes and opens the heart to grace which flows through the sacraments. And so you were watching in the sacraments of initiation First communion or confirmation, depending on your diocese, it doesn't matter which order they are. But each one of these sacraments, the sacrament of baptism opens the heart to grace. The Holy Spirit is called down into this soul. Then the next two sacraments of initiation expand the soul so that it can now make sacrifice. Now we're ready for spousal union, and this is to give love unconditionally. Now, if you notice, if you look back up here, now there's a new avenue, a new opening of grace. So for all of you millennials out there who are riding, surfing the couch and discerning what you're going to do with your life, all your grace flows through your mom and dad until you get off the couch and get in vocation. So what you're getting is second, third hand, and it's a trickle by the time it gets to you. Choose a path and live it. But St. Alphonsus says clearly, again, it's not, God does not bless the choice. He blesses the commitment. So unless you're engaged in sacrificial theology, unless you start giving to God, then you're not open to, to either receiving or conveying grace through your own vocation. When you start doing this, then you see this other avenue of grace from the Spirit, from the Holy Spirit. Now this comes to you. This is called the call to holiness. It's not the call to what am I going to be when I grow up. It's the call to holiness. Which path will I take? And there are only two paths, and that's marriage or holy orders. Please purify your call to holiness, not by saying I'm supposed to be a priest. I'm supposed to give my life to God and then let the superior determine whether I will in fact be a father. For those of you who are discerning marriage, take the whole idea of children out of it. Will you stay married if the marriage is not blessed with children? Will you give yourself to God by giving yourself to this person? Incidentally, the vocation of marriage is much easier. It's a lower vocation. Why do I say that? In the, in the, the church father said this. I'm repeating them, but 
practically, we as marriage, we get to pick our own instrument of purification, and we generally pick someone who loves us. The religious does not have this luxury. Their instrument of purification is a superior who does not love them as the spouse would. So this is a harder form of sacrificial theology, but it's still sacrificial theology. And so when you are engaged in spousal union and now are able to give love unconditionally or as unconditionally as possible, then the union has no condition. This is the purity of love. This is love of God. This is love of God purely. This is love of God in the dry. This is the Mother Teresa hearing the whisper of God and then writing that whisper for 50 years in vocation. This is hearing one time, I love you, and that's enough. And so it is union for the sake of union. This is Christ embracing the cross. And this is true Catholic sacrificial theology that we've lost. There's a hymn that talks about um, Christ's passion. The Protestant version literally is, and for us he endured cross and grave. The Catholic version is, for us he embraced cross and grave. Much, much different disposition. So determined was our Lord to give himself that through three falls he gets up. He places himself on the wood he will not be deterred. He will not stop until it's done for the very people who are killing him. So the understanding that, and women, this is a tough one, but I just deal with it on too many cases. Um, and that is when you find fault with your, your husband's spiritual direction or lack of spiritual direction because he's not doing it the way you want him to do it, you're not spending enough time on your knees. You're not spending enough time praying for him because grace flows through his office, the, the office of the husband. And so it's about conversion of the family through his conversion, ongoing and deeper conversion. Don't focus on the behavior. Don't focus on the behavior. Also understand that silence is one of the most masculine answers in the cosmos. It is the answer with which God answered his own son when he said, let this cup pass from me. It means do the last thing you were told. He stood in front of the priest and witnesses, and he promised fidelity. And if he's in the house, if he's praying at all, give thanks to God that that flicker grow into a flame. But it's not going to grow into a flame. You smothering it with huge logs, saying we got to pray this, we got to do this, we got to do that. It is fanned with the flame of docility, obedience, and the occasional request. Then we move into fatherhood and motherhood. At this point, it is responsibility for a soul, and we lose our individual identity in that spousal role. The idea that I, with, a small, child, with small children at home or any child at home, could have a night with the boys, or as a priest, I could not be a priest today. I could not offer the sacrifice of the mass. We are configured to God through these roles, through the priesthood of the domestic church and the priesthood of the Catholic church. We're configured as men in this sacrificial role. Mothers, you are supporting us in that role. You are Mary at the foot of the cross who is making sacrifice in the same way that God the Father is. In this way, if we do this, you have children who stay in the faith, not children who are scared away from the faith or who are, are looking for a way to depart the faith. We have a responsibility for the soul, and we show them this. We exemplar this by losing our identity, our individual identity in the spousal role. And through the spousal role, we, use, we lose our identity in the white-robed myriad of those who have given their life to God, who have made good on their sacrifice. And then last is the patriarchy and matriarchy. We're perfecting our sacrifice to God through vocation. And so in this, what you're finding is once you move into this, what occupies your thought is less and less of self, more and more of the souls in our care and, and God himself. And so the one advantage that the adversary has over us is he's constantly thinking about salvation in a negative sense. We as patriarchs and matriarchs, 
should be constantly ordering ourselves to salvation in the positive sense, because it is through these stations and these offices that grace flows, and it flows to the extent we have the capacity to convey it. What increases our capacity is spousal union, unconditional love, the understanding that we're responsible for souls, and perfecting our own sacrifice. This is, this is John the Baptist. I must decrease so that you can increase. I must become less in the individual, in my individuality, so that you can become more in me. It is in this way that we start to move out of actual grace into sanctifying grace, into the grace that makes us appealing to the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit wants to occupy, indwell in us, because we are the agent, we are the willing agent without reservation of the Holy Spirit. And so that capacity is then increased. There's got to be less of us. And so Kate is saying in one of the question and answers on virtues, you spoke that we are roped together as mountain climbers. She brings up a good point, especially in, voc in vocation, whether we are in marriage or in holy orders. It, and that is that we scale the spiritual heights, not weighted down or drugged down by those below us, but to establish a foothold, to tie the rope secure so that they might ascend. And then at any given time, they may pass us. And so in this way, two mountain climbers scale the heights of the Alps, one scaling a particular to a particular promontory or point of fixing a rope for the other. The other's not holding him back. And I think that oftentimes when you start to hear that subtlety is your husband is holding your back, your back, your wife is holding you back. You can do such good in the church. No, you can't. Your spouse first. Perfect your, your sacrifice, your unconditional spousal sacrifice. See Christ in the other. Help them, give them the opportunity to perfect their own sacrifice. The Blessed Mother did not once point out to our Lord on the cross, you're slouching, stand up straight, after all, you are the deity. She did not do that. She supported him in every way that she possibly could. She, no less than God the Father, is giving their son. And they and their support are enabling him to make good on his sacrifice. At any given time, one of us may be ahead of the other. It's not an always hand-in-hand -hand path for you priest, for you religious. This is the love of your order. Your spousal vocation, your spousal gift is to your order, to your bishop. Many of you, many of you are serving a bishop now that is cuckold, that is apostate, that is heretical. This doesn't mean you get to abandon him. It does, does not mean that. Vocation is based upon what's called sacred contract. What does that mean? It means if the other side breaches, I am not released from my obligation. Listen to this language. Modernly, infidelity is being used and even being okayed as annulment or move from diocese to diocese or to quit the priesthood altogether. The infidelity of the, nut of the other has absolutely nothing to do with your obligation, nothing. Your obligation is to God. Your obligation, because that's who you swore to. That's who you made the oath to. So the weakness of another individual or your own weakness does not release you from the bonds of vocation, the sacred contract which says, I will do what I promise to do regardless of what anyone else does or doesn't. The adversary wants you to make it about you, not about God. Because in the moment that you make it about you, then you shift from Mary's caveat to, beyond, to Lucifer's. Because at the end of the day, the, the flow of grace is dependent upon one word. One word. The flow of grace flows through conformed will. It flows through a will freely conformed to God. And at the end of the day, the flow of grace is dependent upon one word. Mary's fiat is, be it done unto me according to thy word. Lucifer's fiat is, be it done unto me according to my word. And at the end of the day, it's either his way 
or your way, and he'll give it to you either way. But his way leads to eternal life. It leads to the flow of grace, not only to you, but those in your care, those souls with whom he has entrusted you. Lucifer's way leads one place and one place only, and that is distance from God. So with that, we've got 15 minutes left, and I'm going to go to the Q&A. All right. So this question, what happens when the husband, okay, let me go back up and I think I'm mystical. Okay, we talked about. Yeah, Kyle, if you'll scroll back up use, to about 640. Uh, 640. In the chat. Okay, I'm, I'm so what would that be? Um, I don't have your time. I got my time. So, okay, here, here it says, uh, so what you said about widows, does that mean they should never remarry? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So these are politically incorrect answers, guys. This is about spiritual warfare, not spiritual negotiation. This is about life everlasting. This is the battle is unto salvation, not unto satisfaction, Padre Pio. During this most recent lockdown, a group of six to seven families had undertaken to consecrate themselves to Jesus through the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Louis de Montfort method. On consecration day, as St. Louis prescribes that we attend mass, receive communion, etc., we approached our pastor and he offered mass for these families. However, one family thought that this was not in obedience to the cardinal as public masses was not allowed and we wouldn't be in compliance with that. So was it sinful disobedient that we attended mass on our consecration day? I'm not going to touch it with a 10 foot pole because you're going to use my answer as a weapon. And I think you need to talk to your spiritual director. Let me go back and clean up the widow. If you remarry or the widow, or if you remarry, it does not mean that you are broken off of grace. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is traditionally the maximum amount of grace flowed through the person who when widowed or, or was a widower, if they did not have small children to raise, if they're a mature age, they would configure themselves to a convent or a religious order. It's not that the other way is devoid of grace. Please don't listen. Please don't hear that because it's not devoid of grace. One may still live a holy life and be sanctified through this, through this path. And so, um, yeah, don't, don't take that the wrong way. So the belief that there is a limit to what can be dispensed by what was experienced short circuits and limits grace by rejecting it. Absolutely. Because that, this is exactly what Christ asked us to do. This is what St. Paul talks about. Where I am weak, you are strong. It is to give what we don't have. It is to allow the Holy Spirit to multiply within us the, the smallness of us, to work through us as uh, imperfect creatures as fallen creatures to bring about salvation, salvation and grace. So it's it's not by merit; um, it is by grace. And, and so this this is the this is the point. Um, is there a limit that what can be dispensed? It's a limit. What we limit is our the grace flowing through us is limited by our sinfulness, our impurity, our lack of holiness, uh, our desire for holiness. One of the Q&As on virtues, okay, I talked about the mountain climbers. May you please speak to the importance or not of a certain charism spirituality when called to religious life. <laughs> yeah. Pray, the ability to pray. It's not a charism. It's not a certain spirituality. It's to pray the prayers and live the life. It is to pray the prayers and live the life. It is to wake when the bell rings. It is to put the book down when the bell rings. It is obe obedience and docility. And so these will serve you better in religious life and better in marriage than anything else you think you bring to it. If you think you're bringing something to it, then this is, is usually a little bit too much importance on self. God will supply. And so I think this is the whole point is because often you talk to religious, they will enter with a particular, what they think is a particular gift, and that's the first thing the superior tells them to suppress for their own formation and their own purification. And so this is how you find out if it's of the adversary or of God. If a religious is told, this is how the gift, so to speak, is always purified through obedience, St. Faustina, St. Therese, 
Countless saints were told by their superiors to suppress the mystical. Those who were, were holy and it was of God, God reiterated this, or Christ reiterated, yes, obey your superior. It's not of God. You'll get a vehement and adamant response that you don't understand. I'm leaving this order or I'm quitting or it's more, the gift is more important than obedience. And that is absolutely not true. Obedience trumps the gift always. What happens when husband went with the boys for a drink for 30 years and mother did a whole lot of talking about him? <laughs> well, tell me about the children. Are they in mass every time the, do the doors open? Probably not. Are they in good, good holy marriages? Probably not. When you're talking about somebody, you're not praying for them. Very simple. Detraction is, the, is one of the, the primary factors that militates against righteous prayer. And so when we're talking to another person about somebody, we're not talking to them about God. We're not talking to God about the other person. We're talking people to people. And now we're the near occasion of sin. Detraction is probably the most underrated mortal sin in our society. This is the sin that Western society is, is blind to because society tells us that if it's true, you can say it anytime to anybody. We as Catholics are under a much, much heavier uh, responsibility. Catechism of the Catholic Church, section 2475 through 2483, offenses against the truth. Read it, love it, live it, learn it. Because this is where we fall down all the time. Um, we absolutely fall down here. Oftentimes with the taste of the Eucharist on our mouth, in, on our tongue, we'll say something derogatory, detracting, or scandalous about someone else. Um, I grew up in a part of the world where uh, um, the ring of the sword of detraction, the shing, when that sword was drawn out of the saber, sounded like this, bless her heart, but, and then whatever follows is going to be derogatory, detracting, or scandalous. And so this idea that we can say these things in the foyer of the vestibule of the church um, immediately after mass is just beyond egregious. It's, 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 it in and of itself is scandalous. So the, the understanding that we have a higher obligation to the truth as Catholics. Why do we have a higher obligation to the truth as Catholics? Because we eat his flesh and we drink his blood. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the physical manifestation of truth. And if you kneel to receive and gossip, then your mouth is in conflict. And if you receive on the same tongue, our Lord, that you scandalize, that you detract, that you gossip, then that tongue is the tongue that both blesses and curses. And the inner conflict makes you very attractive to the adversary. Where can we learn more about the church's te teachings on sacrificial theology? The patristics are an excellent place to, to start the writings of St. Uh, Augustine, um, St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, but go back, dust it off. If it's written in the last hundred years and doesn't have an imprimatur, it's suspect. The new FTC manuals, approximately when they, will they be available? And the FTC videos we bought, are they going to be reworked? The videos, no. The manuals, you're looking at probably 60 to 90 days. Um, any more questions?